Welcome to everyone who has come to listen to the lecture series uh, Mobility Analysis and Planning for Human Scale Cities, organized by Mobility Lab University of Tartu. The lecture series is part of the transport planning course. With the lecture series, we try to cover the needs of the transport planning course, as well as to offer interesting topics and discussions related to Indian transport planning. And the lecture series lasts until April 26. And we have invited to speak here mobility and transport planning experts, including researchers from Estonia, Europe, and Australia. And the lecture series seeks to answer the question of how to promote human scale, sustainable, and just cities through mobility analysis and transport planning. We are recording the lectures and make the recording publicly available. If you have any questions during the lecture, um, please keep them at the end of the lecture when we have time for discussion. You can also write the questions and comments to the chat of the Zoom and we will read them during the discussion part. Uh, today is the second lecture, uh, which is uh, given by Carl Seider, who is a postdoctoral researcher in Mobility Lab, University of Tartu. So, and uh, this research here compares the bike share system of Tartu and Helsinki from the perspective of uh, public policy. And today's lecture, Carl will talk about active transport policy, what, why, and how. And now I give the words to Carl. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you very much, first of all, to the Mobility Lab for supporting my research and uh, uh, for inviting me to speak. Uh, this is uh, a record number of Estonians for attending one of my lectures. Um, so yes, active transportation. Uh, this, uh, this discussion is intended to be an overview of uh, what it is, uh, why, what is the case for it and, uh, and how it can be, how it can be promoted. Uh, this is the outline of what we'll talk about. Um, yeah, what is the case? The arguments from health, environmental, social, uh, economic spheres. What are some of the um, most strongly recommended policy approaches overall? And then finally, what are some of the political challenges uh, to, 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 to actually implementing these, these policies? So first, um, what is active transportation? Quite simply, it's, it's using your own power to get from one place to another. Uh, usually we think about walking and cycling. Uh, and I think it's important to point out that this is, this is often done in combination with public transport and that overall combining all these modes, public transport, walking, cycling, and, and other modes of active transportation really constitutes something positive, that being a unified alternative to automobile use. Um, and here in Tartu, we have this, uh, I've seen, been observing this innovative method of active transportation since I've been here in January. Uh, okay, so the first part is why. Um, I, uh, I'm imagining we were taking a, a trip to the library on our, our bike here, and, uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why uh, active transportation is, is supported by so many uh, authorities. Uh, the first has to do with health and specifically physical activity. Uh, the promotion of active transportation is supported by all, uh, almost all the major uh, national and international health organizations, like some of the ones that I've listed here. Uh, it's worth remembering that physical inactivity is the world's fourth leading uh, risk factor for death. And I looked up in Estonia, the uh, percentage of adults meeting the WHO physical activity guidelines is only uh, 36.7 and for adults, uh, adolescents even less. So there's obviously a uh, potential here to improve, to improve activity levels. 
Um, what are the relationships between active transportation and uh, health? For me, this is one, this has always been a compelling slide since I started my research. Um, it is uh, by the authors listed there, uh, some of whom are really kind of the, uh, the fathers of active transportation policy research. And it shows uh, how countries with uh, high active transportation rates uh, have, low, have lower uh, levels of obesity. And it's not a perfect relationship and there's no claim of uh, causation, but still I think an interesting and uh, compelling relationship uh, nonetheless. Um, another example from the literature, this one more recent, uh, was a, a, what they call a, a prospective population study done in Glasgow, uh, where they studied, they looked at several thousand people and compared uh, what happened to their, over, over a period of years, what happened to their health, versus what their commuting habits were. And they got some very interesting and uh, results indicating the, the strong uh, potential role for active transportation and health, uh, including those who were commuting regularly by bike, seeing a 45% lower risk of cancer and a 46% uh, lower risk of heart disease. Uh, there's also the uh, air pollution. Uh, this is the fifth leading uh, risk factor for death. And uh, some evidence from Canada, we had the chief medical officers of health of uh, the greater Toronto Hamilton area calculated that if, if they were able in, just in that area to increase walking, cycling and public transit use by uh, the percentage points you see there, each year they'd prevent 154 premature deaths, uh, 90 hospitalizations uh, just from the exposure to the emissions. Uh, then we have road safety. Um, again, I looked up Estonian, the Estonian road safety record it is neither the best nor the worst. Um, I think you could safely say that if Estonia improved its road safety record to uh, that of the better countries, you could basically cut those fatalities and injuries in half. Um, as we'll point out, um, for, for active transportation, uh, safety comes with numbers. Um, and this is something I discovered recently, uh, a fairly recent review, and it shows this, this safety and numbers uh, phenomenon. It's basically showing uh, how much cycling is done in a given country uh, versus uh, fatality rates. And what you see is that the more cycling there is in a given country, the less the chance of fatality on a per kilometer per uh, cycled servant. You might find Estonia on that, on that chart, uh, somewhere between 250 and uh, 500 if you're following the numbers on the bottom. So Estonia not doing too badly, but could be doing, could be doing a bit better. Um, I wanted to highlight the, the very important relationship uh, between speed of vehicles and health. And a lot of the public policy work is effectively based on this relationship. Uh, 30 or 40 kilometers an hour, the uh, odds of our survival are quite high, about 80 percent. Once you get up to, uh, once you get up to uh, 50, 60, 70 kilometers an hour, these these odds of surviving decline dramatically, and this has led to a lot of uh, this, this feeds into a lot of the thinking about how road design should be worked and how speed limits are set in uh, in leading countries. Um, other interesting thing from a safety point of view is that, that it, it looks like if you have safer roads for walking and cycling, it ends up being safer for drivers too. Uh, so I show one, I, I, I summarized one study here uh, from the United States, uh, basically showing that increasing the density or the amount of separated bicycle facilities leads to a 44% reduction in the fatal crash rate overall. Um, and then similarly, this, um, this shows the um, uh, various, the, the improvement in walking and cycling deaths per capita uh, for a number of different countries. And I, I realize you maybe can't see all the details where you are, but the, the, the country, uh, sorry, the highest position in this, in this chart is the, is the United States. And you can see that it has improved somewhat over time, but not very much. And then the other ones are uh, European countries like Germany, Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, and so on. They have improved over time a lot more in terms of their fatality rates over time. But what's interesting here is that these are two 
the, the graph on the, or the chart on the left shows walking and cycling deaths per capita, and the chart on the right shows cars and light trucks deaths per capita. In other words, both of them follow, have followed a similar pattern uh, over time. Okay, then the environment. Well, uh, I, don't, I won't have time to talk about all the different environmental benefits of uh, active transportation, but I have listed a few here. Uh, I just want to make the point that it's not just GHG emissions. There are other harmful emissions. There's the question of car ownership and the consequences of car production. Uh, roads and parking. Uh, you need less roads and less parking if you have less cars. And if people want to get around by walking and cycling, this encourages more compact development. Uh, and you have a kind of vir vir virtuous circle. Um, but on the greenhouse gas emission question, this is, uh, this is what we have in Canada. Um, the dark colored bars on the bottom represent uh, emissions from passenger, trans passenger road transportation in Canada. And the chart overall is showing overall transportation sector emissions. And so you see that that passenger transportation is about half of overall transportation sector emissions in Canada, and it hasn't changed much over time. And there's obviously huge potential to reduce those emissions with active transport. Um, this study, um, I'm going to, I think the title is a bit, is a bit misleading. So I'm going to skip the, I'm going to skip the title, but for the record, there's the study. Uh, these people estimated what would happen if uh, a large number of the world's developed countries increased their sustainable transportation rates, including cycling and e-biking, to the level of the best uh, example cities. And they found that by 2050, uh, compared to a business as usual approach, uh, you could basically cut those emissions in half if we, uh, those transportation sector emissions, if we pursue the right kinds of policies. Um, from a social point of view, um, we have uh, increased social interaction in public space. We're not looking at each other so much just from behind the window of a car. Um, and it's a more, more equitable uh, distribution of public space. Um, I like this quote about transportation justice, that, that infrastructure should aim to equally and equitably address the, the needs of all people. In other words, in simple terms, if you can't afford a car, uh, should you be entitled to a less uh, useful transportation system? Um, we see here how much space different types of transportation, uh, different types of transportation take up. And yeah, it prompts the question of whether, whether certain transportation users, should they really be entitled to less public space than, than others, particularly richer ones who can afford to drive. And uh, some interesting research from the United States on this equity angle that I think is, is interesting to highlight. Uh, it shows the rates of uh, walking and bicycling to work by household income in the United States. And you see clearly that uh, as you get, as you move to a lower income bracket, you get much higher rates of walking, which is unsurprising, but actually higher rates of cycling too. Uh, even in the United States where cycling is not terribly popular. Uh, and so this means that addressing the conditions for, for walking, cycling, uh, this, this helps uh, particularly people with lower incomes. And similarly, if you look at the fatality rates, uh, people killed while walking by income in the United States, uh, low income people, uh, twice, as likely, uh, twice as likely to be killed. And, uh, uh, by certain ethnic groups too, African Americans twice as likely to be uh, African African American children twice as likely to be killed. Uh, so I think there's a strong equity argument. And then finally, uh, the economic argument. Uh, this person is a Canadian researcher. Uh, really, I think he's he's brilliant. Like a, and this guy is uh, Todd Littman. He's an encyclopedia of uh, knowledge about active transportation policy. And here he has listed uh, all the uh, ways that active transportation is beneficial uh, from an economic point of view. And these are all effectively things that could have dollar, that don't always have dollar values attached to them, but they could have dollar values attached to them. Obviously there are costs involved in promoting active transportation, but as you can see there, there's a much longer list of uh, benefits. And 
Uh, in Canada, that same uh, study in the, the, the GTHA, we called it, I mentioned earlier, uh, they made these calculations that effectively, if you, if you increase public transit use, cycling and walking, uh, the health benefits in dollar terms could be enormous, 2.2 billion per year. And the reduced congestion benefit could be 15 billion per year uh, by 2031. Um, so uh, major, major economic benefits potentially available. Um, this is, uh, I won't dwell on this one, but it's an illustration of the, of the same idea. It's, it's the idea of um, uh, full cost accounting. In other words, attaching dollar values to things like uh, unpleasant noise, you know, all the various negative effects of, uh, of car use and comparing that to other modes and showing that, um, that, that our decisions have an impact on societal costs and pretty significant impacts. Uh, so in the end, uh, this is the famous, the famous saying, um, this one uh, that I rented here in Estonia several years ago, it, it runs on money and uh, makes you fat. And this one on the other hand runs on fat and saves you money. Okay, now, um, if we are, if we're convinced that active transportation is a good idea, um, and I, uh, I am certainly convinced that it's a good idea, then uh, the obvious question to ask is, well, what do we need to do in terms of concrete policies that would, uh, that would help increase those active transportation rates? And that, that's something that's really worth, um, you know, in some ways obvious, but I think often gets forgotten that the benefit comes by actually increasing those numbers, by getting people who are not walking, cycling, and taking transit to start doing those things. Um, yeah, again, this is uh, one, of my, uh, one of my heroes in the active transportation policy world. He says, basically makes the point I just made that, that, that the urban transportation systems, uh, for better or for worse, are the results of public policy. That we, we make a certain number of decisions about how wide a road should be, what the speed limit should be, how much parking limit they should be, and, and that's what ultimately affects the different rates of transportation we have. Um, in the background, uh, we have to acknowledge that in, in the transportation world historically, uh, both in, you know, to, a, to a stronger degree in North America, but both in North America and certainly in Western Europe, uh, the focus since World War II really has been on uh, increasing automobile convenience, and, uh, and this was effectively the main concern in transportation uh, uh, planning in all cities. And people often talk about this, uh, this predict and provide approach. In other words, this is the old way of doing things. We predict how much traffic we expect next year, and then we try to provide enough lane capacity and intersection width to get that traffic flowing through our city at high speed. But obviously this has resulted in uh, too many roads like this one where, uh, where I live in Ottawa. And people are, are realizing that this was, not, uh, this was not a good idea. This is not accomplishing the things we want. And among other things, it's, it's extremely uh, costly. So we need, we need a new approach. And this is where you get um, this new kind of vision zero style ideas about how we should do transportation planning. And I think a couple of uh, points on Vision Zero. Um, one is that, that the, the idea with this, this concept is basically that, that traffic deaths are preventable through the design of the system, but nobody has to be killed. We can design roads and traffic in such a way that people will not die. Um, and, and secondly, uh, well, that it's worth it. And then, and then the other angle that's interesting about it particularly is that, that in the design, uh, the idea is to think that humans are, uh, are fallible, that we make mistakes. We are going to make mistakes in traffic and that the infrastructure has to be designed so that when that, mistakes when that mistake happens, it doesn't result in fatal or uh, serious injury type consequences. Um, so, um, if we get to the specific policies, um, you know, with that, with that as background, specific policies, what supports active transportation? 
Well, the first is infrastructure. And effectively, I think you could, you could say that infrastructure that works for active transportation very much pays attention to that speed and safety relationship. So if uh, you expect cyclists and pedestrians to move in the same space with traffic, then you have to calm the traffic on the street and get the speeds down into that sort of 30 kilometer an hour range. If you want the traffic to move at a faster speed for whatever reason, then you have to separate the pedestrians and the cyclists from that traffic through some kind of physical uh, means. And this is showing uh, uh, what they call triple A facilities, all ages and abilities. What's the difference between uh, something that'll really work for an eight-year-old kid and an 80-year-old man uh, versus what, what isn't? Uh, okay, so uh, this is uh, this Puchet and Bueller. Uh, I think these are the people who have looked at this most systematically. Like, what are the differences between the countries that have succeeded in having high active transportation rates and strong safety and the ones that haven't? What are the things they have done? And, and this is, uh, I think, in one of their most famous studies, this is the list. And I'm just highlighting there that the top three are effectively infrastructure, uh, infrastructure questions. The other ones are worth noting as well. Uh, just an example of some very nice infrastructure from uh, Copenhagen. Uh, I don't. I think it's. You can see it's the kind of place you you would you would look at and you would want to be there and you would not feel any any threat to your to your safety. Um, second is uh, land use. There, uh, I think you'll hear more in other lectures uh, about people who know a lot more about this than me. But just noting that. Uh, from, from an active transportation point of view, it's worth bearing in mind what is a, a walkable distance, what is a bikeable distance. There are various arguments, uh, but you know it's in this area. Maybe a, a distance people will walk, maybe a kilometer, maybe 500 meters. Bikeable distance, maybe three, maybe 10, somewhere around uh, five kilometers. If the distances to get to the important destinations that you need to get to are farther than that, then people will tend to opt for something else. And this is why, from an active transportation point of view, as well as for many others, uh, these compact, mixed-use style communities, uh, why these are a good idea. Um, you've probably seen this kind of thing before. It's, it's a good illustration of, of what happens in terms of the, the accessibility of amenities if you build something sprawling versus if you build something uh, grid pattern and dense. You can see in the, the, the diagram on the left in that neighborhood, you can kind of imagine what it would be like. I think it would actually be a lot like, uh, like Tartu is, the, the downtown area, to reach a lot of important destinations uh, within a mile. Whereas that other place, it's uh, one of those classic uh, subdivisions for featuring cul-de-sacs and curvilinear streets where you can walk for a long way before you encounter anything, uh, anything useful and it uses up a lot of land as well. Um, just listing some examples of the kinds of uh, policy responses on the land use front, uh, aim for these more concentrated form of developments, uh, what we call TOD, or a 15 minute neighborhood, at least that's what we call them in Canada, limits on urban boundary expansion, uh, stronger control of uh, government planning. I put land banking because that's something that uh, I think I think has uh, land banking, in other words, governments buying land and then controlling <laughs> how it's developed. Um, coordinating the planning between all levels of government is a classic problem where uh, you know one level of government is maybe organized and another one is not, or they're just not on the same page. Uh, and then a variety of policies that, that support this mixed use, you know, having all types of, uh, of buildings, amenities, residential area employment, having this mixed together instead of separate areas scattered throughout the city. Um, general higher densities versus lower densities, and things like this more human scale development, uh, shorter blocks, narrower streets, that kind of thing. Uh, briefly, we want this kind of uh, neighborhood looking something like this in Copenhagen. That's, that's good for active transportation and good for a lot of other things as well. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the idea of multimodal active transportation and transit. This is partly my own, you know, it's my own opinion or philosophical point of view. To me, it seems that if, if we want to have a viable 
alternative to owning a car or owning a second car or using those cars a lot, if we really want the alternative to be competitive, it means that you have to be able to use all these modes. You have to be able to walk, bike, take transit, maybe use a scooter, bike share, and combine all these modes together in an efficient, seamless, appealing way. But that all together, if it's done well, might be uh, a viable alternative when each one on its own uh, may very well not be uh, in real life situations. So uh, to give you an, an example of why that's, in, why, why that's important, this is um, showing transit catchment areas. So let's say you had a, uh, let's say you had a light rail system here in Tartu. Um, if you rely on people, you know, if your only sustainable way to get to the transit station is walking, well, then the catchment area is about that walkable distance, about a kilometer. But if you can expand that and make it feasible for cycling, which you could do by doing things like having better infrastructure, better route planning, bicycle parking at stations, and uh, the thing that I'm working on right now, bike share, then you can increase the catchment area of the, of the transit system uh, up to maybe five, six, seven kilometers. And that makes a huge difference for uh, potential ridership. Um, but similar relationships apply in other, you know, in other situations, just trying to show that combining these modes really adds to their strength and their viability. Um, and another example, yes, um, well, my first example of, of the kind of thing, this is what I'm studying right now, uh, the, the smart bike system here in Tartu. Um, I'm quite early on in my research, but uh, I think it's worth noting that, that this is uh, a positive and innovative innovative approach in the sense that the system is run uh, by the public transport authority and as part of the public transit system. And my pictures there, one show a bike share system that well is available in the winter, meaning you know, implying that it's uh, implying, showing that it's a serious mode of transport. It's not just for recreation. People actually want to get somewhere and, uh, and they can in the winter. And it's, uh, there's, a, there's a bus stop hiding in the background there. And then my own uh, public transit car, which uh, I, I moved here, I bought a public transit pass for uh, X many dollars, I forget, very affordable for three months. And it includes uh, use of the bike share system without me having to do, spend any extra money. It's, it comes to mind, I think that's, I think that is very promising. Um, another example is, um, Mobility as the idea of what's called mobility as a service, uh, which you may have heard about or, or already or will hear about, uh, I'm sure. The basic idea is that uh, instead of, as an alternative to driving a car, a company comes to you and says, don't buy that car. Instead, pay us a monthly fee. Uh, maybe, you know, and depending on what services you want, it could be more for you. Pay, pay us a monthly for you. So subscription to our service. And we will give you an app. Whenever you want to go somewhere, you punch in the app, you know, I want to go to uh, Mesquite 34, let's say where I live. And the app will come back and say, walk 20 meters, take this bike share, ride it to this bus. The bus will arrive at 1542, take this bus, get off the bus. Uh, and uh, you know, walk another two blocks and you're at your destination. But it could include, let's say, the use of taxi, the use of car share, the use of rail, the use of bus. And uh, key in it is that you don't pay separately for all these things. The provider takes care of that for you and coordinates your trips. Um, I think challenges are getting buy-in from all the various authorities uh, to organize themselves in that way. But still, I think, yeah, I think it's a promising, a promising approach. And it's, uh, it's being implemented in some places, like in Helsinki already, I believe they have, they have that available, at least in some parts of the city. Um, and, then, uh, and then worth pointing out uh, as well, that like in a lot of uh, public policy, we like to say that you need, you need a stick as well as a carrot. Uh, so we need to do all the things that make active transportation and public transit appealing, but then we also actually need to do some things that make driving less appealing, thereby changing the balance so that uh, people are more inclined uh, using all the tools at our disposal to change the balance so that people are more inclined to choose these active modes. 
And these are some of the, uh, the commonly recommended and commonly employed approaches. Uh, low speed limits, enforcement, uh, transit priority, limiting parking, making parking expensive, uh, this road pricing or congestion, char congestion charging like they have in Stockholm, maybe some of you've been there, various parts of Norway, I think they have this as well. Uh, and then taxes on fuel and vehicles, uh, all these things make driving less appealing. So if politically you can, you can get some of those things done, then uh, it makes progress. Okay, now, but how? Um, this is actually the area that I have maybe the most personal experience with research-wise. Um, I started my, uh, my, my PhD thesis research from the starting point uh, where you are now in my lecture, basically. I thought, I think active, I'm convinced that active transportation is a good idea. Uh, I read all the literature uh, and it's pretty clear what we have to do if we want, you know, in terms of concrete policies, what we have to do if we want more active transportation. But politically, it seemed like a very difficult thing and I wanted to know more about why is this difficult? We all know it's a good idea. Why are we having trouble? Uh, there are others who have looked at these kinds of issues, um, and I, I highlight a couple of examples. Um, one, uh, Wang in, in Hamburg, uh, looked at barriers to implementing pro-cycling policies there, a case study. Uh, he highlights basically this lack of space because of historic car-oriented planning of the type I was talking about earlier, and uh, a lack of political support that is effectively a function of that environment. That, well, it's hard to get, uh, let's say a city councilor thinks that it's hard for him to get elected if he supports policies that uh, are anti-car because you're living in a, basically a car dependent place. And then in England, uh, similarly, uh, uh, stakeholder views, did a huge number of interviews and surveys and they found, uh, these are you know, examples of the things they found fairly important ones. Lack of local level money, I think it's you know, obvious. Uh, and then again, this political support connected with these auto-oriented transport planning traditions, basically. Uh, so in my research, I compared uh, Ottawa with, with Helsinki. And uh, as you can see here, uh, all you really have to pay attention to is the size of the, uh, the red in, in this, uh, the red in this chart. Uh, that's the, uh, the share of trips uh, done by driving. And so Ottawa is the one with a lot of red, the, the red devil as I call it, and Helsinki is the one with less. So you can see, uh, I started from this position, well actually Ottawa is, is, does about as well in North America as, as you can do, but uh, you can see how much of our transportation is driving. And Helsinki is a leader in the North American context and uh, they, you have a completely different result in the end. So. This is the result, and I wanted to know about well, how did they how did they achieve this? And I picked Ottawa and Helsinki uh, partly because they're they're quite similar cities in a lot of ways that some might argue might might have an influence on active transportation. Uh, they're actually population density is surprisingly not much different. Total population is similar. The climate is similar. Uh, topography is similar, and car ownership is actually similar. So. Um, uh, my argument was essentially, well, it's not those, those, these things are too similar to explain it. It has to be, it has to be other things. Um, but then, uh, this is not the extensive list. When you look at the policies, then it becomes pretty obvious why Helsinki is better than Ottawa. Helsinki did all the public policy things that you're supposed to do to have high active transportation rates. Uh, they have much more uh, metro and light rail. Uh, they have a, a much more uh, multi-use path kilometers, much more pedestrianized streets. If the Ottawa does not too badly in some categories, but overall the investment is clear. Uh, the investment, you know, who's the winner on investment is clear, it's Helsinki. And if you look at that and you look at all the other policies that I won't talk about here, you can see there's no surprise why Helsinki is ahead of Ottawa. Again, the question for me is, well, why? How did they do this? How did the advocates get those policies implemented? Uh, so yeah, that's my question. Uh, I won't, I won't repeat it. That was what I started with. 
And uh, I don't want people's eyes to glaze over, but it's just, a, it's useful as background that the framework that I was working with basically says that in a given policy area, let's say transportation policy and LCD, you typically have groups of advocates like, like two soccer teams basically competing with each other for dominance in that policy area. And this framework says that, that depending on the circumstances, depending on the resources available and the circumstances in which those teams are fighting with each other, one of them, uh, one of them will be on top. And so I wanted to know who are the teams and uh, who is on top and why. Uh, I used semi-structured interviews and document analysis. I basically, I talked to a lot of people and I read a lot of documents. That's, that's how I did the research. Uh, using that framework as a background. And this is my, uh, my overall summary of what, what I found out. Um, effectively, I found that, that in Ottawa and Helsinki, you had these advocacy coalitions, like the groups of people that engage in coordinated activity to promote active transportation. They were actually quite similar. Uh, and their values at the core were about livability and environmental protection in both cases. And their makeup was similar, yet to the inner city, city councillors, people from NGOs, uh, people from environmental organizations. And uh, the momentum in favor or against active transportation was similar over time. That in the 70s, there, with the oil crisis, crisis and so on, and a greater environmental awareness, uh, momentum was strong. Then it faded in the 80s as people got richer and drove more cars. And then it came back in the 2000s when there was more environmental concern. Uh, but what I'll talk, talk about next is that, that the, the sort of background level, there are a number of background level uh, uh, factors that were completely different, that made the life of the active transportation advocate in Ottawa way harder than the life of the active transportation advocate in Helsinki. So I'll get to that in a minute. But the, the effect was that in Ottawa, you had a kind of fragmented advocacy that had a hard time building momentum. You had walking, cycling, transit being promoted, um, stop and start, sometimes a bit coordinated, sometimes not. Um, but in Helsinki, uh, this, this group from the beginning was uh, pro AT overall, connecting the walkers, the cyclists, the public transit people. And, uh, and they were quite coordinated and they ended up being the dominant uh, force in transportation planning in Helsinki. Okay, so now to talk about what those, what those, uh, those, those background level factors were. They weren't those other things that I listed earlier, uh, but I identified were these in this, this column on the, uh, on the left here in, I'll, I'll, I won't you know, cover all of this, but basically in land use in Helsinki, you had a tradition of directive city planning. I, the city was, had a lot of control. They owned a lot of land. They were able to say exactly what went where. Um, and by the time active transportation advocacy happened, they already had a city that was at least fairly well organized. Whereas in Ottawa, uh, private interests uh, were a lot stronger. By the time active tra transportation advocacy came along in the 1970s, the city had already been built according to a more sprawling auto-oriented tradition. So you had that sort of difficulty. The transportation planning traditions, like the manuals they were working with, the training they had, these were different. Uh, in, in Helsinki, there was this overall objective, which is really actually decreasing or limiting the growth, the growth in car use. Like how many cars we have, how much of the trips are being made by car. Whereas in Ottawa, the transportation planning goal was uh, eliminate congestion, keep these cars moving. Uh, and then this led to technical specifics that were more you know, at the level of intersection design. Uh, in Helsinki, they'd start by looking at, well, how are we gonna get the pedestrians safely through this intersection? Whereas in Ottawa, this came at the end after they figured out where all the cars were <laughs> gonna go. And then uh, in terms of political systems, in Finland and well, in Helsinki specifically, you have a stronger social democratic tradition, and this contributed to higher uh, tax revenues overall and an emphasis on uh, collective responsibility. Whereas in Ottawa, we have this more uh, more typically North American approach where the individual matters more. 
uh, we keep more of our own money in our pocket and have less, less left over for public services like transit and, and bike paths. Um, and then uh, given that I have a couple of extra minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this, a couple of these, uh, a couple of these, uh, th these next ones a little, a little more specifically. Uh, as I think it's, it's quite interesting. Um, I'm gonna skip that and go back to it, uh, hold on. Okay, in Ottawa, one of the problems with was that there was a distinct urban-rural divide in transportation habits, urban versus suburban-rural in transportation habits, um, um, with, uh, you know, with, their, with their habits and their political support. So some researcher classified Ottawa's land according to uh, the transportation habits. And uh, this researcher, David Gordon and his, uh, his partners, they found that, well, he, the total population of what he calls the active core, where there's lots of walking and cycling and so on, it's in there about 147,000. Then Ottawa has this transit suburb where people use quite a bit of transit, it's about 130,000. But then the auto suburb is 802,000 people. Uh, and on a map, this might be interesting for you geographers, uh, it looks kind of like this. The dark part is that active core. The transit suburbs are that next kind of mid-yellow color. And then everything else, is the, everything else is the auto suburbs. And what that means is that you've got a population, and, and part of this has to do with the fact that Ottawa amalgamated was it's an amalg amalgamated and you know, basically grew to include all those areas on the outskirts um, about 20 years ago. But all those areas on the outskirts are votes. And so you now have 802,000 people out of 1.1 million that are basically a, an auto-dependent population. Uh, and in Ottawa, the councillors, this means our, you know, our municipal politicians, they represent specific physical districts. So you get you can imagine the political situation it brings. And I just show that that's the map of our electoral districts. And what I found in the research was that, that the, um, you know, among the supporters in the, the, the pro-active transportation advocacy coalition, there were always the inner city councillors. And in the, you know, on the other side, you had the uh, sort of suburban rural councillors uh, working against them. Uh, and increasingly, these, these inner areas outnumbered because of this amalgamation. So kind of a frightening picture. And actually, from the little bit I know about Estonian uh, urban planning, I think this is kind of an interest. There's some interesting, par there interesting parallels there because it looks like there's quite a debate happening about how the suburbs are uh, planned and developing in Estonia. Um, and then the other one is on the question of lack of, uh, lack of money for transit. Um, just uh, I, in, auto, in, in, in the case of my research, what I found was that, well, it was really the transit money that affected everything else because active transport, the money you need for active transportation infrastructure is not really that much, but the money for transit is huge. And municipal governments in Canada and I think similar in Estonia, they don't have much money available to them on their own. They only have uh, property taxes and uh, transfers from higher levels of government. Meanwhile, transit's really expensive, and it means that in Canada, if you want to build a big fancy light rail system, you have to have money from these higher levels of government. And you have to get this money all at the same time. All levels of government have to contribute, and this is affected by politics, as you can imagine. Lining this up happens once in a while. And the effect is that uh, spending on money happens sporadically. And we have this rapid, uh, what do you call a, a sorry, a busway system, like a uh, buses that operate on their own. Uh, I'm forgetting the term for it. Buses that operate on their own roads. That, that's our. That was our major uh, public transit system in Ottawa, and it's quite good. And when there was provincial money uh, funding available, this system developed and developed rapidly. But then money dried up, and then nothing happened with our public transit system for seven years. No improvement. Uh, then we managed to get some money to start a small light rail line. Uh, it was basically possible because the city already owned the line and it was not in use, so it didn't cost much. And there was basically a 20-year gap until the city was able to get money again. And 
And the problem is that in the interim, the city's growing and there's pressure to accommodate all the mobility that people want. And so the road network grows to accommodate this. And then you have this kind of cycle of increasing car dependency, more support for cars, and you're, you're stuck. So um, I'll wrap it up by going back. Um, I tried. Uh, I tried to come up with well, what does that you know what does that mean for advocacy strategies? Maybe that, that's not so much uh, so much an academic question, but about worthwhile to think about that. Um, and so, for each of these major challenges, uh, I did some thinking and you know discussing with people like, well, what would be what would be a potential response? Uh, and so, for land use, we found things like. Um, electoral reform, like perhaps we'd be better off with a system in Ottawa where we where, where, where politics functions according to party as opposed to these specific geographic districts that might help. Uh, without getting into it in Ottawa, the development industry has a bizarre influence on, uh, on planning. Uh, they're allowed to contribute money to uh, electoral campaigns. So all kinds of things that shouldn't happen, happen. Uh, but better land use planning, uh, and more control from, from governments on what happens with land use planning. This would clearly help, uh, however that could be accomplished. I think land purchasing is one of those. Um, transportation planning traditions, um, I thought really like it's gonna, it, it's so obvious that if, if the training for the engineers and the transport planners, if it continues to be auto oriented, then you will have a never ending a never ending battle. So advocacy to actually change those manuals, change that training, that would make sense. Um, working to find a, a situation where you have dependable public transit revenue. So instead of getting these one-time agreements, having you know, the certainty that we get X many billion every two years means that the city can effectively plan far out and develop the kind of transit system it needs. And then finally, um, again, I, I think uh, applicable here that there's a tendency in active transportation advocacy to kind of forget about the suburbs because it's harder to do there. And then what happens is uh, you effectively lose the support, you, you, you forever lose the support of that population politically in getting uh, more spending on active transportation. So deliberately working to build infrastructure in the suburbs, make active transportation work in the suburbs. This helps in the immediate, you know, it helps get those people moving, but it also helps in terms of the, should help in terms of the political support, I think. Uh, so that's all, I think. Um, let's make sure that I, I didn't miss something. No. Um, yeah, if you want to talk some more, uh, I'd be happy to do it in a place like that. Uh, and those are my, my coordinates. Uh, thank you. So what I thought. Thank you. Good thank you, Carl, for Do we have some questions? Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes, we do. Uh, I have a question. Um, I understand you've been in Toronto for a few months now. Yes. Uh, what are maybe the biggest differences which you've uh, observed, in, especially in comparison to uh, Helsinki and uh, Ottawa, in regards yeah. of maybe uh, emphasizing active transport? Yeah, I can't help but think about that uh, uh, um, as I walk around the city. Um, I would say what, what strikes me about Tartu is what a strong situation the city is working from uh, in terms of its, you know, in terms of the old city, or whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, Tartu not including its suburbs. This is like a, such a walkable, uh, particularly walkable community. Like it's certainly the most walkable place that. Uh, I think that I have ever I have ever lived. Uh, you really have in touch to this accessibility to all the places that you would want to go uh, quite easily on foot. And while it's not perfect everywhere, I find it, the conditions quite good for walking. You see a lot of uh, 
streets with low speed limits, uh, you know, and whether by accident or by planning, they're designed in such a way that the traffic doesn't actually move too quickly on it. Um, um, so yeah, it's, for, for Tatra on the positive side, I'd say this, uh, this walkability really high. And then, and then also I can see, um, I can see, like, I, I don't think you're any, I don't think I were any farther ahead in Ottawa, you know, but I can see momentum on the cycling side. This bike share system uh, combined with the new infrastructure that I can see some of this infrastructure on recycling is quite good. Um, some of it looks like quite, the, the newer things look like quite well, well designed. So I think a lot of potential there. Um, and then I think on the, I think the difficult part is this question of the suburban, the suburban development and how that goes. I think probably that's that's the hard part. Um, Helsinki is like like uh, like modern, rich perfection for a, a transit-oriented city. I'd say like it, it's it's sort of unbelievable how they have the kind of transit system they have in a city of that of that size to me it's you know and then there are people there that think it's kind of a like a like done but for the purposes of of the population's ego or something <laughs> to compete with europe but i think this is like you know if you want an example of a city organized around transit house in case it's the place to go um and ottawa i think we have we have to learn from both of these cities um, um we're not as walkable as Tartu, we're not as transit friendly as, uh, as Helsinki. Um, so yeah, anyway, Tartu, I just feel like it's, it's like in a very good position, but at a critical point. You, know, it, it, you, haven't, you haven't made so many mistakes that you're in a huge mess, but it could happen, you know, or it's maybe already started to happen. And if, if, you, if you get a handle on it, then uh, it could be a very, very, very good. Still. Thank you. We have more questions. If I have one, yeah. uh, it was said in the beginning that uh, the more money people make, the less they use public transport. So how could we like motivate them to use public transport instead of cars? Because they don't really care if they need to pay a little more tax. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, well, I think it's the question of money and convenience. Like some people maybe you know, think if, if, if finding a place to park your car is difficult. And on the other hand, you can walk down the street and get on a train and relax in a comfortable seat and do some work or check your email. Uh, you'll choose that option just because it seems easier to you. Uh, so I think that's a that's a large part of it. like the my first move to Helsinki the, the landlord I was renting it from uh, I don't know somehow he said this thing like yeah no I don't own a car it'd be hell to own a car in this neighborhood but I thought, yeah that's what we need to do basically make it difficult <laughs> and make the other thing really nice. Mari has a question. Yeah, you see. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, first question is this walkable distance, uh, no, bikeable distance, five kilometers. How much does the electric bikes uh, change this for walkable distance? Does it increase it? Well, or not? Yeah, for sure it increases it. Uh, I'm embarrassed to admit that I don't have like some source I can quote. Uh, but it seems to me that, uh, like, if my memory is right, the general thinking is maybe it increases out to about 15 kilometers. Okay. Again, the e-bikes add a whole new dimension to potentially to this question. And that's something I've been thinking about for a place like Ottawa, like bike share and e-bikes. Like, if you're dealing with a city that is already spread out, then the usefulness of an e-bike is even more than if you're in a tight walkable city like Dartu. And uh, second, I would like to uh, bring out that Estonia is, uh, I think, in the fifth place uh, in Europe in owning uh, personal cars. 
So we are we are not in a good place right now. And uh, it, I, I'm quite certain, yes, I have seen the. So almost every adult citizen has uh, personal. There is a, one personal car almost per, per one adult citizen. Yeah. So it's it's really, really high in Estonia, actually. Not, not in a good yeah. sense. On the other hand, I guess, again, my, my information on, say, the modal split statistics, like, you know, what's the share of, of commuting that's happening by car in, in Tallinn and Tartu? Again, I don't remember exactly the numbers, but you're still at this point uh, well ahead of uh, even good North American cities. Okay. So uh, I guess ownership, like I found out in, in Finland, for example, car ownership is very high, but in Helsinki, the day-to-day the, the -day use is not so high. Uh, and it's still worth fighting for that. So from, from a personal experience, we are living uh, 15 kilometers from, from Thailand mm -hmm. uh, and uh, commuting every day, yeah. uh, basically. And uh, we had, uh, for a couple of years, we had one personal car yes. uh, per family. And it was actually very hard to to cope with it yes, <laughs> so, yes. so after, after a couple of years we gave up and bought a second car so not right, very right. proud of it and right now i'm i'm, I'm uh, thinking of uh, electric car instead yeah, of it yeah, yeah. so could it be like 15 kilometers could this be a solution uh, but yeah. what i wanted to comment is actually i know that tartu and Thailand both are working right now hard on bringing mass to the cities yes. and okay. I just got information that uh, Tallinn received uh, financing for, uh, for an innovation procurement for, for a purchasing mass solution. So, so uh, I think this is something that is yeah. uh, going uh, in a positive way. Good, Hopefully, glad to hear. We'll, then, we'll bring a change. I will add yeah. that to my, my knowledge of what's happening here. And, and, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, okay. Say so I understand. No. Yes, I have as well. Maybe the students have in between. Uh, I have one small uh, question. So uh, I imagine that uh, going off from cars to other uh, modern uh, transportation modes is quite long term, and I can imagine two different mechanisms how how this happens. First one is that people who own already a car, they start doing something else. Yes. The second one is that people who do not yet own a car, yes. as growing up, they do not uh, just simply buy it. Yes. And um, are there differences in which, which works better or which has worked better? Or is there any empirical reason? Very, it's a very interesting point that I've been talking to some of the people that I've been doing my interview research about that with, with here. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I may be only guessing as much as you, but I guess my, my own inclination is that it's easier to have people never adopt car use than to adopt it and change. I mean, you know, let's say there's probably some older people in your family who you think whatever it is, they're set in their ways, they're not changing. Uh, and it's like this with transportation habits. There's, some, there's a segment of the population which is, is basically lost. Um, but if I had to say something, uh, again, uh, optimistic about Estonia, you know, I would point to those, this rate of, of, of uh, act, active transport or the rate of, of car driving for commuting now, like I said, relatively low compared to uh, most North American cities. This means that you're in a good position. And if you do things right, as I was trying to think of a way of saying this, I said, like, you should not actually have to go to hell to decide that it's not a good place to be. Uh, and I think Estonia has a chance right now through the right kind of uh, incentive policies and good infrastructure to get it so this younger generation doesn't choose uh, that way. And I, I also don't want to say that, that like driving a car, it should not be like seen as some kind of moral question. You know, people will do what people will everywhere will do whatever is the easiest, most convenient for them. It has to do with uh, how the system is set up and what's provided for them. And uh, if Estonia provides the right thing, I think uh, there's, a, there's a good future for, for at least holding on to what is a pretty good, in international terms, a pretty good situation, I would say right now. 
Yeah, good going on with these challenges. So how the system is set up and what, what are the external factors? We have one question in the chat from Shimin Huang. Uh, how do you consider seasonality play a role in active mobility? From cycling point of view, Estonia has long winter and it makes cycling less enjoyable. I'm wondering how Helsinki deals with seasonality and cultivates the cycling culture. And, and adding on top of that, the e-bikes might also be a solution yes. for winters. Yes. Okay, there are maybe, I would say maybe two things about this. One is that even if, let's say, active transportation, well, first of all, most of the time, um, walking in public transit, provided you have good maintenance and good service, these should not be terribly affected by uh, winter use. It's more the cycling that is a challenging thing to, to organize in such a way that people will do it in the winter. And even if you gave up on cycling during the winter months, you would not be doing too badly overall because the real winter months are not so many months of the whole year. So even if you lost you know, for a certain share of the winter, uh, some active transportation because people went from cycling to something else, um, you know, they, they went from cycling to driving, uh, it wouldn't be that bad. Um, Second, of course, they, you can hope that, well, maybe they, they bike in the winter and if the transit is good, they switch to transit in the winter. They, they bike in the summer, switch to transit in the winter, provided your transit is also good. Um, but in terms of those, you know, I, 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 I've uh, gone to conferences and read materials and so on about how they have achieved very high uh, winter cycling rates in places in Finland, like this Oulu, for example, Oulu, Finland, if you want to look it up, this is the most famous place for for winter cycling, uh, you know, and I think Oulu has like a higher rate of cycling in the middle of winter than Tartu has in the middle of summer, and uh, it's near the Arctic Circle. And without getting into details, it, it has to do with uh, very well-designed infrastructure and very good maintenance. Uh, the infrastructure is designed in such a way that the snow can be cleared very effectively, and they have a very rigorous, serious system for doing this. And having done this, they find that, well, people will continue, quite high numbers of people will continue to cycle. Um, the last thing I want to say about this is that um, one of the dangers is that winter can be used as an excuse for not doing anything for the whole year. And winter is, winter is short. Like Even if we acknowledge winter is a problem, uh, it'd be crazy to give up on cycling because, well, for three months in the winter, it's not good for everyone. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, thank you for such a comprehensive answer. And I would also like to do one more comment on the previous, like um, the um, transportation infrastructure that you have mentioned previously in here in Estonia. Yeah. I personally moved to Estonia like half a year ago from uh, Germany and the Netherlands. So I have experienced there in Germany, both in Germany and the Netherlands, how convenient it is yeah. to. So I didn't have any driving license, but then I got a job here in Tartu, and then I know that I need to move here to Tartu. But while my families are actually living in Kurosawa, so on the Sahara, by the islands, right? So from the transportation system point of view here in Estonia, the south connection is pretty good. You can uh, travel with the train easily, but east, a west, this kind of um, uh, this kind of horizon is like not really convenient. So in order, that means like from Monday to Friday, I work in Tartu, and yeah. on the weekends I need to go to Kurosawa. There yeah. is really no public transportation to, yeah. to Tartu, Kurosawa, you know? And then for that purposes, then I had to go and get a driving license and had to buy a car. And I really do wish from the bottom of my heart that like Estonia could like uh, the planning system, the transport, transportation planning system could do better from the point of view, like um, West and East kind of access. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, interesting. I, 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 I see your point, of course. Uh, I guess I don't have much to add given that I, I haven't really thought about this sort of, you know, the national level uh, transportation system. Um, you know, but, but, uh, clearly, 
you've seen the kind of train systems they have in other countries, uh, Denmark, Netherlands, and so on. Uh, yeah, it would be, be great if Estonia could have uh, start to develop something similar. So it, it has something to do with the population density. Well, yeah. So, so uh, having having low number of, um, of potential users, that's also a case in suburban areas, even if the transit system is built up very well. So what about the last mile in those yes. low populated uh, suburban areas yeah. and, and the investments in, into that? Yeah, well, that I guess in that last mile, that's where uh, these systems like, for example, bike share, uh, uh, maybe a little, maybe, you know, a little more controversially, the scooters, um, these are uh, considered last mile solutions. And then, you know, another one, uh, without getting into all the potential pros and cons, people talk about these autonomous vehicles uh, as being a potential uh, first mile, last mile solution, particularly in these rural areas, because you know, effectively, if you could run a driverless, if you could run driverless on-demand shuttles to get people from kind of far-flung areas to the major trunk lines, uh, you might be able to do it economically with these autonomous vehicles in a way that you can't with the traditional bus system. And so that that could that could be one good use of autonomous vehicles, getting people from from more uh, suburban, semi-rural to the major trunk lines that get people into town. I think one of the main issues uh, we have in the winter is that when it snows, uh, the first uh, areas to be clean are the roads. Yes. And all the snow from the roads are then piled up on yes. bicycle paths. Yes. And sidewalks. Yes. So even though we have actually the bicycle share system all year round, yes. it can be used even in winter. Right. Yeah. Then it's nearly impossible to go anywhere with bicycles. Yes. And all of the streets are covered, all the pavements and uh, bicycle uh, paths are just covered in ice and snow. I've made the same observation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've made the same observation, but I think, yeah, I think they're the answer. If I were me and I was talking with the city government, you know, I think there must be people there thinking this already, but I think they, they should be looking at, mo at the model like Oulu. I mean, this, they have a system, there are places where they do this and they do it well. Uh, and there's no reason given sufficient funding and political support that thought you couldn't do this as well. <laughs> Questions here. And then Seth, I think Cassandra, if somebody has more questions. Maybe we can uh, read, uh, read out the comment from Anne Vaisk. So, having lived in the Netherlands, I also realized that streets in Tallinn are quite dark in the winter months, which makes cycling less pleasant as well. And apart from the winter we had this year, the Dutch winter is not even so much different from what we have here. Yes. Yes. So the seasonality has the snow component and the darkness component yes. uh, in, in a way. So Actually, safety yeah. part. I forgot to mention that one. I haven't been in uh, Tallinn really in the winter. Uh, but anecdotally, one thing I thought Tartu did very, does very well is, is the lighting. But to me, walking around, at least in the central part of the city in the winter, it feels Compared to where I live in Ottawa, it feels striking that it's light and beautiful, and I, I enjoy being out here in this in this darkness with this nice light. Um, yeah, just just a yeah personal observation. Maria Ranaman has also comment. Yes, so Maria uh, asked uh, previously with her voice. So so in Copenhagen, as an example, the walking and bicycle lanes are clean from snow before the car lanes. Yes. So it is a question of priority. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. There is no more question. Then we thank you once more. Thank you. Like and, that. Uh, we have a next virtual lecture on Thursday, and we are waiting you to come to join us. Yes, and then next, yes, next Thursday, then Tunis Harius, the city architect of Tartu, will be the lecturer in two days. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh,